You're listening to the Tell and Talk podcast on Tell and Television. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of the Tail and Sports Talk podcast. I'm Austin Speaker. I'm Mitch Courtney. And I'm Jane Sarabola. So let's get down to it. Uh, I know baseball season's over. I know the Cubs won the World Series, but that's not stopping the hot stove from heating up here. Um, one note I want to make on free agency is Rich Hill is on the MLB trade rumors uh, free agency list as a projection of three years, $50 million. Uh, several teams are on the list, but the Yankees are on the list. Mitch, how do you feel about Rich Hill? About that? Can't see me if you're listening, but I'm shaking my head because Rich Hill is probably the worst free agent starter to ever <laughs> be valued as high as he is valued right now. Okay, that's good. That's good wording because he's not a bad starter. He's no. just valued really high. Right. <laughs> Three years, fifty million, insane numbers for a guy who really didn't do anything in his career until now, and then you're going to say that a team is going to give him that much, and he's probably a back end starter anyway. And I don't think the Yank the Yankees do need another starter. They can't keep rolling out Evaldi for five innings a game. But Rich Hill's not the guy. You got to start. You got to make sure Severino's ready this year. Uh, make a move for somebody else. Rich Hill's not the guy. The guy's he's geriatric. He should be in a nursing home right now, not lacing up the cleats <laughs> and pitching in a major league game. Yeah, we had a good conversation before we started today about um, Ken Rosenthal's top 15 free agents. Rich Hill sitting there at number four with that anticipated three-year, $50 million contract. We have players that are like at seven in um, Jose Batista, and then at 15 is like Edwin Encarnacion. I just don't see how you value Rich Hill over those guys. It doesn't make sense to me. But as you were just saying, this was his contract year, and he played well. So that's, that's I mean... Right, That's the only thing that makes sense out of it. Yeah. For the years and the money, how old is he, you said? 37? 36. 36. 36. And uh, he's not worth that money, but because of the way the MLB works, because there's no salary cap, and because owners are free to spend however much they want, he might get a deal like that. But I wouldn't do it if I was in any position to hand out $50 million. The last person I would give it to is Rich Hill. Well, to kind of put that in perspective, uh, Aroldis Chapman is... Uh, well. Trade rumors had him projected at about five years, 90, but he's seeking 100. Um, I'm not sure if he'll get a deal like that. I'm sure someone out there might uh, pay $100 million for a closer of that caliber. But there's just <laughs> there's just so much question with Rich Hill because he is so old. You just don't know if his arm's going right. to give out at any minute. Would you really want to invest three years that, yeah. in what could be considered a ticking time bomb? And with the Chapman thing, I like Chapman a lot. I think he's... A once in a lifetime talent, a guy who throws over 100 on pretty much every pitch, unless you roll him out there eight times in the World Series, whatever yeah, Joe Madden happen. did with him there. But if I'm the Yankees, I'm sitting there and he wants five years, 100 million, and you don't think anybody else is going to go as high as you, I'll, I'll do it. Because the Yankees' bullpen struggled mightily last year after they traded away Chapman and Miller. They got some good pieces. Glaber Torres for Chapman and, and Clint Frazier is now the top prospect for Miller. But that bullpen needs some help. It's gonna be it's gonna be an interesting uh, off season to keep track of um, where Chapman goes, where Edwin and Bautista goes. Um, one of them's probably gonna sign with Toronto, and whoever does whoever Toronto doesn't get probably can't sign the other one. Right. Probably you know Boston's gonna be out there looking for people. It's gonna be a really interesting um, off season. And speaking of the Blue Jays, um, they already lost one of their free agents in R.A. Dickey. He signed a one year deal with the Braves uh, as of Thursday morning. But that's going to be, like I said, it's going to be fun to keep track of day in, day out. But that's going to be it. I just wanted to get Rich Hill off of, Mitch Ch off of uh, Mitch's chest to start the show off with that on a high note. And uh, we're going to move over to the NBA uh, real quick. You know, NBA is going on. We don't have our friend Kenny here today. He wasn't able to join us. But the big thing here is, I guess, defense doesn't matter if you're James Harden, if you're scoring a triple-double and still beating the Spurs. Who needs defense, right? And that move of putting James Harden the point guard has looked pretty good for them. Like you say, he's getting almost a triple-double um, every night. And this kind of, I won't say rejuvenated his career, but, I mean, Houston was kind of on a downfall, and now James Harden's finally being talked about again, and so is Houston. So maybe this is something that Harden needed, and so did the Rockets. Yeah, I think the biggest storyline for the Rockets is that Dwight Howard isn't there anymore, and their defense seems to have improved because of that. I don't think Howard was really ever part of that team as much as they had hoped because when Howard's healthy and when he gels with his teammates he's a, a all-star player probably a hall of famer 
but Harden is the type of guy that wants every shot. He wants to be the guy not sharing touches with anybody, and I don't think that was a very good idea to bring him in by Daryl Morey anyway, but Rockets playing some defense, which is rare. Harden maybe hiding a little more on defense because he's playing point guard. Right, but they'll hold the to hold the Spurs, a team that's so fundamentally sound and so good at putting the ball in the basket any way they can, to hold them to 90, uh, 99 points over the course of four quarters. That's obviously very, very good. Um, and that's actually the Spurs' third loss right. of the season so far. And this is a team where you might expect them to lose anywhere from 10 to 15. 15 yeah, right around 15 uh, over the course of a full season. They already got three, and it's uh, it's not even Thanksgiving yet. I mean, how long did it take for the Warriors to get three losses last year? Right. That's a, it's funny to put that in perspective. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and with the Spurs, they're they're old still. Tim Duncan's not walking through that door anytime soon. <laughs> and although they have a few nice pieces, Kawhi Leonard and Jonathan Simmons, they're, they're nice players, but... Manu Ginobili is 39 years old. He's the third oldest player in the NBA. Tony Parker's not getting any younger. And Popovich isn't with his core group anymore. Duncan was the, the key piece of that, and I think that's hurt them a lot on defense and on offense. At some point, this Spurs franchise has been on a high for so long. has to fall down. That's kind of just how it goes in sports. They had mm -hmm. that core three, and now they're getting older. So maybe the Spurs might... We'll see them on a decline. Yeah, and like you said, um, if they do start to decline because of age, maybe uh, maybe guys just aren't performing the way they uh, they normally have been. The Celtics we saw around a decline for a little bit, but now they got guys like Crowder and Isaiah Thomas who are just young electric players, and they're doing really really well right now. Um, they lost to the Wizards last night um, by by a score of uh, one eighteen to ninety three. So they were, they got blown out by twenty five points, but. That's neither here nor there. They're still a very solid team that can contend in the East. Uh, and speaking of teams that can contend in the East, how about the Knicks beating the Nets last night? Yay, you beat up yeah. on the Brooklyn Nets, Mitch. Good job. Not <laughs> something they should really run through the streets and celebrate about, but it's a win, and I'll take it. Biggest storyline with the Knicks right now is the triangle. You can tell that the players don't really want to run it. They don't fully understand it, and Phil Jackson... In my opinion, if he wants the Knicks to run the triangle, he should be down there coaching them, not going through someone else. He tried it with Derek Fisher. It didn't work. He tried it with Kurt Rambis. That didn't work. And now he's trying with Jeff Hornacek. He's got to do it himself if he wants it done right or just let Hornacek run the offense if he wants. He's the original innovator of that offense. And uh, I'm, i got to ask you, do you think it's a personality issue? Do you think a guy like Melo has to have the ball and score? Do you think a guy like Rose has to drive to to the hoop? Do you think that it's kind of an ego thing with these old superstars that, or who, they still think they're superstars, that they can't really run the proper cycle of the offense? Yeah, I think it's definitely playing a part that these guys want to do it their own way because they've had success in the NBA playing outside of the triangle. But then you look at Phil Jackson, and it's hard to imagine him going away from the triangle just because he's won 11 championships with it. He won six in Chicago and five in L.A. So I think he still believes that it can work, but if he wants it to work the way that he's envisioning it, I think he has to be hands-on with this team. Step in as a coach or even hire yourself as an assistant. I don't know. They need to get it figured out fast. That's a good point. But, um, I mean, it's a small sample size they've had in New York. you got all of these this new talent, Jennings, Porzingis, Anthony, Rose, coming together. It's going to take a little while for these guys to match, especially with a new offense. So they're seven, eight games in. I mean, give it 30, 40 games, and I think we'll really have a good evaluation of how this team's coming together. Yeah, that's very true with the NBA is that, you know, you just never know who's on a cold streak, who's on a hot streak. So when you're under 10 games, it's still a small sample size, like Jaden said. Um, when you start to get... Even if, even not 30, 40 games. When you start to get to 20 games in, you can you can really have an idea of how things are starting to shape up. And that's, that's the weird thing about the NBA is that uh, you can kind of tell really early who's who has a chance and who doesn't. Like, obviously, we all know the Cavs are going to be in it. Warriors right. are going to be in it. Um, I think the Clippers have a really yeah, good chance to be in it they, with the way they're playing right now. They laid a beat down on Portland last night. At one time, they were up by 40. It was wow. 80 to 40. They're playing outstanding defense. Unlike the Celtics, last in NBA defense, which is a little surprising with Stevens, 
they're super young, maybe that's sure. playing a part in that because young stars don't always think that defense is the most important thing, but they have to get that fixed if they want to contend. Right. And uh, I know we uh, got a lot to talk about in hockey and NFL, so this is going to be a quick NBA segment. Uh, we're going to have to end it right there, and we will move over to hockey. And with this uh, with this podcast and us being uh, Western New York uh, people, it's kind of a Buffalo bias, a slight Buffalo bias, because we don't have a whole lot to show for it because, well, they're still not great. Uh, we got Vander Kane coming back uh, as of last night, and Jaden, what did you see from that? Um, I mean, it's definitely good having Kane back since they're so depleted at the forward position. But, I mean, it didn't help much. I mean, Kane still doesn't have a goal in the year. Obviously, he's been hurt. But, I mean, this is a team that just has to – their line points slip night in and night out, it seems like. like they mm-hmm. In overtime, they had – I think they had like eight or nine shots on goal compared to none for the Senators. Like you have to put one of those in the net and then just to lose in the shootout like that is just heartbreaking. I mean, they got a point on the night, but you need to get two there. Yeah, it's a game that you'd like to see the Sabres take two from. They had a bad bounce in overtime. Gergensen's yeah. almost put the game away. They outshot the Sens 8-0 to zero in the overtime period. Kane has a game and a half played on the season now. Nothing really to show for it, but I think yeah. he'll pick it up. It's nice, though, to at least get a point against a decent Senators team without Eichel and without O'Reilly. So you get Kane back, but you you lose O'Reilly and Ennis last night. We'll see how long those guys are out for. Yeah, you mentioned Eichel. Um, he's, uh, he's going through rehab now. He's skating now, so he's going to start doing hockey drills soon, um, hopefully sooner rather than later. Hopefully he's back uh, cl- uh, towards the end of November. Um we know how important Kane is on the ice. Just having his presence out there is important in and of itself, but that's that can only get you so far. So what do you guys uh, expect that he needs to do in order for Buffalo to still be relevant for the next uh, month or so without Eichel? He's got to stay out of the spotlight, first off. He, ha- he can't go out and do what he did this summer or l- last winter, spring, whenever it happened. We can't have this guy in court. He needs to be on the ice, needs to be with his teammates. And I think the Sabres are realizing that they might have made a mistake in bringing this guy in. His attitude issues weren't overstated. They were real, and now the Sabres are dealing with it. So we saw a rumor the other day that maybe Minnesota interested in trading for him. We'll see. The Sabres could be looking for some more defense. Uh, Minnesota really close to the cap there. You'd have to bring somebody back a hockey trade. Maybe Pominville, he's sitting around $5 million, or Jared Spurgeon, a good young defenseman, but we'll see. Yeah, and you said, what do we need to see Kane do? That's all off the ice stuff, which is very true. He needs to fix that. Then on the ice, the Sabres need someone who are going to get points. I mean, they have like three guys who are at the eight-point mark. You need someone on, on your team at this point who's over 10 points and just really rack on the points because – the Sabres aren't scoring, and you see other teams in the league, they have like five, six, seven guys who are all over 10 points, so they're just not producing points at this uh, point of the season. Yeah, and speaking of points, obviously uh, the Sabres did pick up a point last night, which sounds fine. I mean, you lost in a shootout, and you want to grab any point you can, but this is a team where you need to start being hungry. You need to get two points. You can't settle for one point every night. You have to get two. Uh, more, more than... Um, more than half the games you play, you got to you gotta get two points. And yeah. that's what's going to get you in the playoffs. Yeah, I agree. They, they'd they like to have two. They did play really well in the overtime period. The only thing that I would say about last night's game is the shootout. You bring out, um, I believe it was Gergensen's. The last shooter for Buffalo, though, was Brian Gianta. Not the guy that I want to be taking to decide the game. Uh, I don't know what they need to do. They need to buckle down... And really win those games so they have chances to win. You got you outshoot a teammate nothing in overtime. It shouldn't even be close. Yeah, just I mean at this point it's just pretty broad. Their problems putting the puck in the net. They sit in the well below in the bottom half of the league when it comes to scoring, and that's their problem at this point. And it's what we anticipated without Jack Eichel there and Evander Kane missing so many games is they weren't going to score, and they really haven't. Yeah, and when you look around the entire Eastern Conference and who your competition is against. Uh, we talked about how the NBA, it's only a, uh, such a small sample, and um, you know you need a little bit more of a sample to see uh, who who's going to fit in what uh, playoff pitcher that may or may not form. But for hockey, 
you definitely need more of a sample size um, to really. You need to get halfway through the season to really decide who's going to be there. But what do you honestly think Buffalo can have a chance to to sustain themselves looking up against a really really good Eastern Conference? I think they can. Um, the number one reason for that is that Tim Murray put this team together, envisioning O'Reilly and Ennis and Eichel and Kane all playing together, and they haven't once this season. At least one or two have been out every single game. So once you get everybody out there, the defense is still an issue. Leonard's been good enough so far. I think they can make a run at it when Eichel comes back and if they can get healthy and start playing together. Leonard is probably one of the key reasons why this team's actually sitting at five, five, and three at this point. But um, like you said, we'll be able. This is probably one of the most hyped up Saber seasons in a while with um what Tim Murray has done. So once we see that line of Reinhardt, Eichel, O'Reilly, that'll really be the test to see is this a playoff hockey team. But I really think they need to add a defenseman if they were to um do a trade with Minnesota. I think that would be a very good um. Very good for this team. Yeah. And if you have a, a line, a first line like that that you just stated, then you also got guys like Ogposo and Kane, yeah. assuming uh, what Mitch stated earlier, if Kane doesn't get traded. Um, obviously, that's just speculation. But if you can get a team like that and you get some depth, you get some uh, you get some line shifts, and you got guys that you are confident in putting out there and scoring points, that's the big thing here is scoring points, then the Sabres can and have the potential to uh, squeak out a 7 or 8 seed. But it's it's really hard to think that now when you have such a scattered lineup with Eichel not being out there at the same time as Kane is. Kane sitting out a little bit of the year. Um, Akposo, he's he's out there, but you don't hear much from him. Um, yeah, O'Reilly right now is, is carrying them, and uh, Ristolainen on defense, um, I think also he needs to show up. He, we do need a defense, some some defenseman to put the puck in the net. And if you can establish that game as well, then you hopefully you can get more from the Sabres. I think they're looking at defense, but their biggest issue now is, is Tim Murray came in, really was aggressive with the rebuild, didn't want it to take any longer than it had to, but in doing that, he effectively wiped out 95% of the depth the Sabres had in the organization. You don't have JT Comfer, Brendan Lemieux, Joel Armia, um, Hudson Fashion is still here, but you're trading away guys that were in the top 50 for prospects in the league, and you don't want to wait forever for them to develop, but going out and getting O'Reilly and Kane has really wiped out some of the depth that they have. Yeah, now that some of those top players are getting hurt, it's really starting to um, kick them in the rear. Like you said, players like Hudson Fashing are there, but they're not there as of yet. They haven't really showed up. I think he just got called back down to Rochester. Right. But, um, I mean, at least Baptiste is showing up. He got a goal last night, and he's had a few this year, so that's a positive. Yeah, and when you just uh, – I got the standings pulled up here. Um, I'm just looking at the Atlantic Division. You got Montreal at 11-1. Uh, they're Most just, points in the NHL. Yeah, they're just a juggernaut right now. And then right behind them is Ottawa, who the Sabres lost to in the shootout. Um, they're 8-5. and five. Well, now, the Sabres have played good against them all year. I mean, they took a win, and they played well yesterday. Right, and if you got a team like Ottawa, who's second, uh, only behind Montreal, who's just establishing himself as one of the best, if not the best team in the entire league right now, um, if you got a team like Ottawa, who's sitting right there at the top of the division, and Buffalo is playing right there with them, it's, it's, very, it's very positive. It's optimistic. Yeah, it's a good, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it's nice to think about that the Sabres can play with teams up there, but it's all about winning you have to close out games and get those wins and those teams have that advantage over the Sabres and that's really the difference between them I mean the Sabres have a you know a decent record it's not good enough but look where they are in the Atlanta division they're sitting at the bottom right with the Maple yep. Leafs which is no different than every other year pretty yeah, much it's very true it's always uh, Buffalo and Toronto being the laughing stock of the division yep. uh, to go through the rest of the Atlantic you got Tampa Bay uh, you got the Lightning at 7-5 uh, Detroit at 7-6-1 uh, um, Boston seven and six, Florida's at five hundred six six, and then um, one after that. Um, like we said, Buffalo and Toronto at the bottom. But then you go to the Metropolitan uh, Division, and obviously the Canadians are eleven one. They're the best team in there. And then if you go through the other divisions, yeah, guys, you got teams like Ottawa that would be right there at the top with them. Like Pittsburgh's nine and two, uh, nine two and two. Sorry, uh, the Rangers are ten four and zero. Oh. 
Uh, the Caps are 8-3-1. and one. So I'm looking at teams like that, and I'm looking at who can fill out the playoff pitcher. And like you said, Jaden, Buffalo just needs to close out games. They need to get hungry, they need to get angry, and they need to close out games and start getting two points. Yeah. yeah I think the toughest division in hockey might be the Atlantic. I mean, yeah. You have the Metro with the Pens, Caps, and, and Rangers, three playoff teams essentially, yeah. but with the Atlantic... Montreal sitting there. Florida's a good team. Detroit is an underrated team. They're still young. And then we've got Ottawa and Tampa as well. And Tampa has a ton of talent. Buffalo and Toronto, two rebuilding teams. It's tough to play against teams that have been in the playoffs for the last few years and expect to really pull away. But they do need to start putting some wins together here if they want to contend. Yeah, the Atlantic's a good division, but just the East in general is pretty tough. If you think if speaking, if the Sabres somehow get into the playoffs, do you see them winning in a series against the Penguins, the Rangers, the um That's the, the thing Canadians. is if you squeak in there as an eight seed, you got to play you, Montreal, gonna... or if you squeak in there as a seven seed, now you got to play Pittsburgh or the Rangers. Yeah, so it's, it's gonna it'll be tough if they get in, but you know Buffalo fans haven't seen the Sabres in the playoffs in a long time. They so haven't seen any just, Buffalo yeah, team. Yeah, you, in just the you just want to see them there. That's they, the thing. They want to get in, establish that culture, give those young guys a taste of the playoffs give the fans a taste of the playoffs. They haven't seen it in five years. Even if they lose in the first round, it's something to build on. I don't think they have the defense to compete in the playoffs, but maybe you steal a series, probably not. <laughs> Just get those guys in, get them some experience. There's always that saying that once the playoffs start, it's a new season, anything can happen, and you can't take anything for granted. So maybe it is all about just getting there and saying, hey, maybe we can do this. Yeah. But uh, for... Hockey, that's going to end that segment, and we're going to go over to another Buffalo team, which is uh, the Buffalo Bills of the NFL. Uh, they're going into their bye week, and um, for all you listening, uh, me, Jaden, and Mitch, we were all at Mitch's place watching the game, and um, maybe I'm putting this a little lightly. I was a little animated before halftime, a little is that putting it lightly? Yeah. <laughs> the Bills got absolutely shafted against <laughs> Seattle, and <laughs> I'm not putting any, I don't know, sprinkles, whatever you want to call it on it, because it was absolute garbage the way that game was officiated. Not just saying that because I have a little bit of a Bills bias, but because the officiating has been horrible throughout the whole season, not just for the Bills, for almost every team except for Seattle. Seattle has gotten away with a ton of calls and in this game, you've got the roughing the kicker. Okay, you say it's a dead ball, and it's not roughing the kicker because it's a dead ball and he was off sides, but that's unnecessary roughness anyway. And then on the ensuing kick, the ref stands over the ball until there's five seconds left on the play clock, so how do you expect the Bills to kick the ball in time and really hurt the Bills as the, the end of the game approached? Instead of needing a field goal to tie it, they need a touchdown. They don't get it, but... You figure if they need a field goal, they kick it there on fourth down, and they send the game to overtime. Yeah, yeah and like you're saying, so I watched the game with you two, who you guys have a little bit of Buffalo Bills bias. There's no way around mm -hmm. that. But, I, you know, I have no bias, so it's a pretty interesting perspective for me to watch with you guys. But as Mitch um, said, they got absolutely shafted. If you're – there's just no way around it. The Bills should have had a chance to play for overtime. The refs single-handedly possibly took a win away from them, which is, at this point, that's the most important game for them. Mm -hmm. Like you said, that Sherman, that's unnecessary offense. Um, then what really upset me was how they only got five yards for that penalty on Sherman. Then they come and give Robert Woods um, that taunting penalty, I believe so it was, 15 for yards. 15 yards. So how does Sherman get five yards what he did? But then you give Robert Woods 15 for that. Then Which, to go on the Woods taunting thing, he was celebrating a first down, and then uh, I think it was Bobby Wagner. Someone on Seattle's defense came up and just kind of hit the ball. Yeah, yeah, I think it was So Wayne. Woods... Woods just got he got a huge first down. It was third and twenty one. He made that ridiculous toe tap catch on the sideline to keep the drive going, and he celebrated the first down, kind of holding the ball forward, and someone just tried to hit it out of his hand, and then Woods got flagged. Yeah. That, that set me right off. Yeah. And I don't want to be the typical Bills fan base saying the Bills always get screwed, and it's, but they do. <laughs> it's what happens. I mean, the refs do tend to make calls in favor of bigger market teams and teams that are more popular in the NFL, but. This game is not one of the games where you could say, oh, the refs really didn't have an impact because I think if they don't make those two horribly bad calls, the Bills have a shot to win this game. Yeah, without a doubt. It, it was a tough one to watch. 
Um, uh, McCoy and Tyrod expressed their opinions afterwards. Rex, uh, we, yeah, Rex is not shy about expressing his opinions, and they all agreed that it was on the officiating. Uh, they they could have obviously they they kind of took the route like oh we could have made some plays yada yada we could have done this or that yada yada but they all pr did say that the officiating was not good and uh, chief executive for uh, officiating uh, Dean Blandino even took to Twitter to say those were awful calls yeah. right. that was in game too he yeah. did that which is rare right I really liked what Tyrod said after the game was um he's like we're not blaming the refs. We're just looking for answers, which is something you need. Because I mean, it's a great quarter or a great answer out of your quarterback in that position. I mean, mm -hmm. it's great to have answers, and it's it's cool to have the the dean of officiating or the head of officiating saying, "Yeah, those those were the wrong calls." But the Bills are sitting there saying, "Yeah, they were the wrong calls." But so now lost. we lost the game, and we're sitting at four and five. The only thing you can take out of this is that if the Bills were to lose any game. From that point on, it would be the Seattle game that you'd want them to lose because it's an NFC matchup. The rest of their games are against AFC opponents, but you're playing teams like Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, Oakland, and you can only really afford to lose one game, if that, if you want to get into the playoffs. Right. Yeah, this is going to be a really good, uh, <clears throat> a really good playoff race. Um, a lot of good teams in the AFC, and they're all they all seem to be coming out of the West. Uh, Jaden's Raiders are sitting on top of the AFC West right now. They're looking pretty at 7-2 going into their bye week. But behind them, you got Denver and Kansas City, who are right now, if it were to end today, are the 5-6 and six seeds. So you got three teams out of the AFC West who are looking really, really good going into the playoffs. And it's just it's tough for teams like the Bengals, the Steelers, the Bills, who are fighting for a good record in their division. But if they don't win their division, then they're probably not going to make it because of how good the West is. Yeah, I think um, without a doubt, the NFL is the hardest um, organization to make into the playoffs. It's just if you don't win your division, there's only two more spots in your conference to make it in, which that's really difficult. You're saying right now it's in the West, the um, Chiefs and Broncos are the only two teams to get in. That leaves out the Steelers, who are always there, the Bengals, who always seem to be making a push. There's so many other good teams that just won't make it to the playoffs. So, and we'll see what comes down to the wild card weekend. Yeah, I think it's tough, especially for the Bills. If if they only lose one more game for the rest of the season, they're sitting at 10-6. and six. But then you're hoping for Denver to lose at least three of their yeah. last games, and or you could have Kansas City lose at least four. But for teams that have been playing at a pretty high level, that's pretty unlikely to have them lose four out of eight or three out of eight unless something catastrophic happens yeah i would i'd be very shocked if the bills made it to 10 and 6 that'd be right. a very good achievement for them and they still need some help to make it to the playoffs so they have a very slim shot of yeah. making it to the playoffs they this need, year they need trevor simeon to show up because not and by, but what i mean by that is trevor simeon to be trevor simeon right. and not yeah. play as well as he has been playing yeah. um they need the chiefs to kind of drop Dropped the ball a little bit on their end, which I heard a great stat from Adam Schefter earlier this morning was that the Chiefs have won 16 of their last 18 games. Yeah, that's scary for me to think about. <laughs> and that the Chiefs are a good team; they'll probably they'll be in the playoffs. They're not the prettiest around. team. They're not the flashiest team. Right. They're the Spurs of the NFL. Yeah. They just get the job done. It's a good system there. And when you had it, Alex Smith, short passes, get first downs, keep the clock moving, and Andy Reid is a phenomenal coach. He's great at doing that. Now Alex Smith goes down and Nick Foles comes in and people are unsure, but Foles does a nice job of getting another win for the Chiefs. Yeah, uh, we'll talk about what we'll talk a little bit more about what the Bills need to do for their playoff picture in a minute. But Jaden, what do the Raiders need to do in order to keep their spot secure as the number one seed in the AFC West? I mean, they're seven and two now, so you look they have seven more games. I mean, if they go four and three, they, go, they make it to eleven and five, and they'll probably get into the playoffs. I know there's a team that they have a pretty easy schedule going forward. Not easy. Watch but a lot, it. A lot of winnable, <laughs> a lot of a lot of winnable games. Like they play the Texans. You know it's a pretty tough game. But you you look at that, you got to win. Um, they play your guys' Bills. That's a game that you got to win. Yeah, especially at home. Buffalo does not play well against Oakland in Oakland. Yeah, we we just don't play well on the West Coast in general. So they just got you know win the games that you should, and then um, you know go 500 in those 
um, games against the tough teams, and they'll make it into the playoffs since they've got a really good cushion so far. Right. And uh, as for the Bills, Mitch, it's no surprise the Patriots are probably going to win the AFC East. So what's the record? If there was a one record that you say if the Bills get to this point, they can make a six seed. I think you have to get to 10-6. and six. And then you're still looking at other teams to help you out. But if you get to 11 and 5, you're probably in. That involves the Bills winning every single game for the rest of the season. I don't see that happening no. based on how inconsistent they've been right. and how inconsistent the officiating has been. So that could decide another game. So we'll see here. But they have to at least get to 10 and 6 if they want any chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the Bills can really, at that point, only afford, if any, one loss. And right. that's, that's looking really tough for how they're playing. Um, just to put that in perspective for the rest of the AFC, the Ravens are 4-4, four and four, and they're leading the AFC North, which means 8-8 eight and eight or 9-7 and seven might actually decide that division, which means at that point whoever wins the division at 8-8, eight and 9-7, eight, and seven, whether it's the Ravens, Steelers, or Bengals, that, that's going to be it. Then they... One of them's going to make it, and the other two won't at that point. Yeah, same I, with the AFC South. Uh, sorry to cut you off, no, but sorry. Fine. Same with the AFC South. The Texans, are, the Brock Osweiler-led Texans, are at five and three, leading the division. Which means one of those teams are going to get in. Whether it's the Texans, Titans, Colts, or even if the Jaguars, if they win a few games in a row, one of those four is going to get in. The other three won't. And then that leaves the West with the at this point. If I had to really wager a full guess, that my bold prediction is all three Raiders, Chiefs, and Broncos will somehow make the playoffs, like all three, in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, I think the NFL has a good system now with each of the 16 regular season games meaning so much, yeah. and the playoff system is okay, but that's where I have an issue when you have divisions like the AFC North with the Ravens, Steelers, and Bengals, and then... I believe it's the West with the Titans, Colts, Jaguars, and That's Texans. The South. The South. The South. And you're going to see maybe a team that is 500 or below 500 getting into the playoffs. I'd like to see something like the NHL used to do where it's conference standings and the top teams from each conference get in regardless of division. If you win your division, you're automatically in. just doesn't make any sense to me because... These teams are getting in, and they're below 500. And the only team to ever really do anything in the playoffs below 500 was Seattle when Marshawn Lynch had that run against New Orleans. So. I was just about to bring that up when he broke eight tackles for right. that huge run. And, and you think, so you got, like for example, you go to the AFC South. You have the Texans who are sitting 5-3. and three. Say they make the playoffs, and they go 8-8. Eight and eight. Six of their games are against the Titans, Colts, and Jags. So you're, right. getting, you're getting the playoffs at 8-8. Eight and eight. And so many of those games, are, um, half your games are, almost half your games are against your easy division. So I'd like to see something different as well because, you know, those 8-8, eight and eight, even 9-7 and seven teams don't necessarily have a spot in the playoffs. Right. And with the exception of this year because of uh, Jacoby Brissett starting in Brady's suspension, but as a Bills fan, I can almost pencil in every, year in, year out. We play the Patriots twice as two losses. Yep. We play the, the just because it's so Buffalo Bill-ish to do, we tend to split with the Dolphins and split with the Jets, which we need to do this year just to have a shot. Yeah. Just to have a shot. Um, and you, you look at just other teams that are just so good that, you know, it gives them a much better <coughs> chance. And, yeah, the AFC West is loaded, and they're definitely looking pretty. Um, before we get to the game of the week, um, before we each pick our own game to look out for. Uh, Mitch, did you have a trivia question for us this we week? We do have some trivia, and it's based on a guy that came into Buffalo this year and has taken it by storm, Lorenzo Alexander, leading the league in sacks, undrafted in 2005. I'm interested to see how many guys from the 2005 top 10 you could name, and then we'll move on to another facet of the question. Do you have any names that you think... What round was Lorenzo Alexander drafted? He's he undrafted. was undrafted. Oh, he was undrafted. Undrafted in 2005. Undrafted. So top 10 picks from 2005. Just so just so I can... Just so I know, um, Vince Young, Reggie Bush, that was 2006, correct? Right. That was okay. not 2005. Oh, okay. Well, can you geez. give us somebody from the 2005 draft? Yeah, give just a, give us one name from the top 10. I'll give you the first 
player taken, Alex Smith, first overall pick to San Francisco. And you had an Auburn running back going to the Dolphins. Anybody recall who that might be? Auburn running back to the Dolphins. Arian Foster? No. Nope. He's not from Auburn, is he? No. Ronnie Brown. Ronnie oh, God. Second. Oh, God. Uh, a Michigan receiver who played with the Cleveland Browns and the Jets throughout his career. Pretty decent career. War number 17 with the Jets. Oh, um, oh my God. This. Uh, go keep going. I'll, I'll remember that one. Yeah, I'm going to have to come back to that one. We got a Bears running back from Texas. This is a tough one. A guy that had some good years in the NFL, but really never was a star at any point. Any guesses on that? Texas? Uh, Cedric Benson. Oh, I remember Cedric Benson, yeah. yeah. Didn't know he was from Texas. A one-year wonder at five from the Buccaneers, taking another Auburn running back, two Auburn running backs going in the top five. Any Bucks running backs? One-year <laughs> wonders? Cadillac Williams? Oh, wow. Ringing oh, Wales. I remember There's that. Okay, now you you make fun of Cadillac Williams, but I'll tell you what, Madden 2006, Madden 2007, he was unstoppable. Yeah, that's like (laughs) 04 Mike Vick on Madden. Then we've got a guy at 6, the Titans drafted him, still playing in the league for the Bengals, a troublemaker at corner. Got a nickname. Pac-Man. Adam Pac-Man Jones. A guy that I didn't even remember playing in the league. Vikings took Troy Williamson, the receiver from South Carolina. You guys even remember him? Good for them, I guess. Yeah. Um, A guy that just retired at corner, played for the Giants, the Bears, and the Cardinals. The Cardinals took him here out of Miami, just retired the other day. Who did he retire from? He retired uh, from the the, the Bears. He won Super Bowls with the Giants, number Um, 26. Um... I'll probably end up thinking about that one too, like the Antrell roll. Uh, ah, yeah. Um, the Redskins, uh, another bad pick here. Another Auburn guy going in the top ten here. Carlos Rogers, the corner, and then the Lions go out and they take Mike Williams from USC. Jalen, do you have any guesses on the Jets Browns receiver from Michigan? My I God, uh, number se- I, right when you say it, I'm going to so give me um, Braylon Edwards. Braylon Edwards. Braylon Edwards is, is correct. That's who it was. And the second part of the question is, who did the Bills take in that draft? They traded away their 2005 first round pick as a part of the package to go up and get JP Lossman in 04. <laughs> who did they take in the second round of the 05 draft? Oh, I got no clue on that one. Uh, Where is he today? He's not playing in the NFL uh, for good right. reason. For not, good reason? Not a very good draft for the Bills, and he had some success with the Bills. Some Position. plays that he didn't want to be replayed. He was a receiver out of Miami. Oh. Stevie Johnson? No, that's Kentucky, seventh round. Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. He was from Kentucky. Um, receiver out of where? Miami. Miami, the U. Probably one of the smallest Bills to ever play. Punt returner. Roscoe? Roscoe Parrish, second-round pick in 05. Wow. I remember Roscoe Parrish. I, t- I, I liked Roscoe. He was a quick, quick, elusive guy. He just, yeah, kind of got, got into some stuff. Yeah. Oh, man, that's funny. So it's just crazy to think that a guy like Lorenzo Alexander can just come up. I know it's 11 years later after that draft, but now he's leading the league in sacks. He's... Yeah, he's averaging a sack a game. That's just incredible right, right. now. Yeah. He's probably going to be a, he's looking to be AFC defensive player of the year, which is usually a, the JJ Watt award, but right. We'll okay. see if they give it to him just cuz the Bills probably won't make the playoffs. So I could see them giving it to like a Von Miller again or something yeah. like that. Yeah. I don't know. If you ask Lorenzo Alexander where he thought he would be today in 2005, he definitely wouldn't say playing for the Buffalo Bills, leading the league in sacks in 2016. I don't. When he went undrafted in 05, he had to be thinking, "I'm lucky if I even get on a roster at yeah. this point or practice squad." Right. Oh man, that's that's just incredible to think. Like it, it's funny uh, looking back at previous drafts and just thinking. Um, what ifs, uh, what could have happened, yeah. what if one thing went through the other. Like, I have a class with Mitch, and I was like, yeah, do you remember who the Bills took right before the Patriots took Rob Gronkowski? Oh, yeah, Terrell Troop. How awesome mm-hmm. is that? <laughs> but it's it's funny and also painful to think about things like that. But uh, we're going to cap off this show with, as always, our games to look out for. 
Uh, the schedule is kind of kind of rough this week. Obviously, people love watching the Packers play. People love watching the Panthers play or the Chiefs play. But I mean, when you got Packers playing against Tennessee, it's not really a good game. Uh, just kind of going through the schedule, guys. What do you? Um, who are you looking out for? My game of the week is Falcons Eagles. You look at the Falcons; they're six and three. They've turned things around after winning four straight and then losing three straight to start the season. A game that's in Philadelphia, so that favors Philly. Wentz is is back playing well, but I think Atlanta is going to keep on a roll here with Matt Ryan playing as well as he has. I'll take Atlanta in a shootout. Uh, 35 to 24. 35 24, huh? Ah, it's going to be tough for them to stop Julio, who's obviously one of the best receivers in the game. Matt Ryan's having an MVP season, uh, right up there with Brady and Carr. Um, yeah, I, th I would take Atlanta winning that one because Philly hasn't been performing as well as they have been the first uh, three or four weeks. <clears throat> or, sorry, three weeks because week four was their bye. Um, so they have kind of declined. I would take uh, Atlanta winning that one relatively easily. Um, I'll take I'll take 31-17. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with the Falcons on that one also. I'm going to go 31-23 Atlanta. All right. And, uh, Jaden, how about you? Um, for my game of the week, we're going to go um, stay in the NFC. I'm going to go with the Vikings at the Redskins. So you got Minnesota who's sitting at 5-3. and three. This is a team that started 5-0 and oh and was considered – probably a top three team in the NFL. I look at the power rankings, the Cowboys are snuck in the number two, and the Raiders are number three. Very big surprise there. They're going to Washington, a team who's four and three, four, three and one, rather. Their last game was a tie, and they're coming off a bye. So this is a big, um, this is a big game for the Vikings, considering how tight that division is. You know, you got the Packers who are right there, and they're probably going to make a late season push like usual. And the Redskins got to keep winning if they want to get into the playoffs. It's probably looking like the Cowboys' division at this point. They're sitting at seven and one. So like, same with the Bills. You're in a wild card spot. You just need to keep on winning. But and this one, I think we go with the Redskins. I really don't have too much faith in Sam Bradford leading the Vikings. They have some injury on defense. They're um, big defensive tackle Shreve Floyd. They're not sure when he's going to come back. So I think I think it's going to be an ugly game. I see the. See like a thirteen to ten Redskins. Yeah, I think that's pretty spot on. The Vikings are have been a little disappointing after starting off so hot. Uh, their offense has fallen back down to earth, and Sam Bradford is playing okay football, but he needs to be better if they want to continue to be on the winning track and, and get to ten and six, eleven and five, and make the playoffs, mm. especially in that division. Although it's been a little off today, but. Detroit's in the playoffs as of right oh, now. Yeah. Detroit is playing well. Matt Stafford, extremely good late in the games this season. But going back to the game here, I don't think the Redskins are going to take it. I think that the Minnesota defense is good enough to put a hold on Kirk Cousins in that offense. I don't think many points will be scored. 17-10 to 10 Vikings. Yeah, I'm going <clears> to... <throat> I'm not sure who's going to win that one. I do think it's going to be an ugly, low-scoring game. I do think it's got a lot of turnovers in it. I think it's got a lot of fumbles, picks, whatever you got to do. There's, There might even be a safety. There might even be a muff punt. It just has that kind of game um, feeling going into it. Uh, I'm going to take the Vikings um, only because they do have to keep winning. The, like you said, the Lions are in the playoffs right now, and I don't think they want the Detroit Lions to take the NFC North. I think they want to. Um, I think they want to, you know, get into the playoffs again, and they want to kind of take the title with them for the division. They want to really establish themselves. Uh, I think it's going to be a close game. I'm thinking 17-14. Uh, I'm thinking I'm thinking Vikings over Redskins, but it would not shock me at all if the Redskins uh, came out and played. And Kirk Cousins balled. I know he can he can do it just as well as anyone. And Sam Bradford, I agree with Jaden. I don't think Sam Bradford is fit to lead a team. I just think that the Vikings defense is still going to be good enough to uh, win them games. Kind of like how the Broncos have been winning. The Broncos defense have been winning their games, not exactly their offense. The Broncos, you know, they have more a lot more help than Bradford has. They have no running game in Minnesota. You're right. Stephon Diggs is your number one, which is great, but. I mean, the O-line's not doing very good for Minnesota. He's taking a lot of hits each game. So yeah. I would not be surprised at all if the Vikings didn't make the playoffs this year. 
Yeah. Yeah, especially with, with they have been declining. Uh, they started off uh, five, four, and oh. five and zero, oh, five and zero. Oh, now they're five and three. Yep. Yeah. It's how how quickly tables turn, right? Exactly. All right, and to end it, um, you mentioned the Cowboys earlier with them leading the NFC East at seven and one. Yep. They are part of my game to watch out for this week, going against uh, Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh, and that's going to be interesting. Um, Dak has played some great games. He's definitely earned a starting role in my eyes. Um, but the Steelers are definitely a force to be reckoned with, and it's going to be interesting to see if Dak can keep up with Big Ben. He is out there. He's playing. He's got Antonio Brown. He's got Sammy Coates. He's got Lev Bell in the backfield, who can also go into slot receiver. And that is just such a high-powered offense. It's incredible. Um, That's a team that can put up 35 points without even trying. And I'm just wondering, can Dak Prescott, Ezekiel Elliott, Des Bryant, Jason Witten, can they keep up? I think they can. I think it's going to be a shootout. I don't think either defense is going to contain the other offense. I think uh, Pittsburgh is going to win at home. I think the Cowboys are going to end their their seven-game winning streak is going to snap. And I think the Pitts, Pittsburgh Steelers will win that one 45-42. Wow. Yeah, that's a bold prediction there. I think that Pittsburgh is a little shaky right now with Ben coming off of injury. They lost last week in his first game back, but he's 2-6 and six in career games when he's coming off of injury, which shows that maybe they bring him back a little too early when they do. Part of him being a big, tough guy, but I think Dallas is just such a good team. So many weapons on that offense, and the defense has been okay this year, good enough to keep them in games. And, and Zeke, Dak, Dez, Witten, you hit on them all, that offensive line. It's the reason they're seven and one, eight and one now. Seven and one. Seven, seven and one. one after the the win against the Browns, dominated the Browns, and that's what good teams do. They stomp on the throats of the teams that they should beat, and they they crush those teams. And Dallas has done just that this season. I think they beat Pittsburgh, and Pittsburgh has another slow day on offense, twenty eight to seventeen. Okay. I'm gonna agree with you, also, Mitch. I think the Cowboys are gonna win this one, which it is a game that the Steelers really need because they're not in the lead of their division right now, which is very unusual of them. But I don't see the Cowboys putting up 45. I could see a high-scoring game, but I just don't know if Dak Prescott has 45 points in him. He's like he's a, you know, a check-down type of quarterback. They don't trust him to go downfield quite yet. I mean, there's a chance. Tony Romo can come back whenever also. And that's that big debate, Dak or Romo. And oh. in my eyes, you got to go with Dak at this point. He's leading you to 7-1. and one, mm-hmm. And there's just how can you pull away from that. Very easily could be 8-0 after that week one loss to the Giants. Right. And, um... I mean, it's definitely a big debate if Romo should come back in because he leads that franchise in so many categories, and he's really just a huge icon in Dallas Cowboys history. But, you know, I just think the Cowboys take this one and keep rolling. I think it's more of a 24-17 to 17 game, but it's very potential for um, Pittsburgh to come back and win this one. Just Big Ben doesn't really have bad weeks back-to-back very often, but I still think the Cowboys take it. Yeah, yeah. just, just another point on that Dak-Romo situation. I think... Jerry Jones would love for Dak to fall a little bit so he could get his guy back in there. His relationship that he's formed with Romo over these years has been strong, as strong as probably any owner-quarterback relationship besides maybe Bob Kraft and Brady. But he really wants to see Romo succeed, especially in the playoffs, and he, he feels that they've put a team together now where Romo has a shot to get them to a Super Bowl. But I think Dak gives them a better shot right now. He's not making any mistakes. Well, he's making some, but he's not making enough mistakes to put them on a losing track. Right. He's made a couple rookie mistakes. Actually, sorry. He's just made a couple mistakes in general over the course of the season. That could have happened to really anyone. He's not doing what Carson Wentz is doing right now. Carson Wentz is kind of doing a lot of rookie mistakes. He's trying to try too hard going down the field. He's trying to do too much. Dak has such good composure back there. Ezekiel Elliott running one way and Dak running the other. It's a very tough offense to stop. Also, obviously, Cole Beasley is doing great. Des Bryant is one of the best receivers in the league. Jason Witten's a top tight end in the league. Uh, all reliable. You know, he's yeah. starting every game for the Cowboys since when? How long? How long has it been dra- now? Like 200 was, career starts now? <laughs> he was drafted in the same draft as Romo. Oh, geez. Romo went undrafted, if you all know. Oh, yeah. How about that? But the thing is with the Cowboys, none of this is possible without Ezekiel Elliott. 
Dak's success comes right off of Zeke's success. You know, a rookie quarterback needs that running game. Zeke's provides that for him. You know, it's just when I mean, you see in so many teams, you don't have a running game. It directly impacts your passing game. And, you mm-hmm. know, just Dak and Zeke together really is what, why is this team 7-1? and one? Right. And, uh, you know, when you compare any running back, not just a rookie running back, but any running back to Eric Dickerson and Barry Sanders, that's obviously very high praise. Um, but that's going to do it for this week's edition of the Talent Sports Talk podcast. So until next week, I'm Austin Speaker. I'm Mitch Courtney. And I'm James Thrallow. All right, thanks for listening.